Welcome to Mrs. M Teaches English. This is the first lesson in a series of online lessons for the IEB prescribed novel, The Dream House by Craig Higginson. This lesson should take approximately one hour of your time. Please pause the video whenever you need to in order to write your own notes and to annotate your own copy of the text. If you have misplaced your copy of the novel, or if you left it at school before the coronavirus lockdown was announced, I advise that you purchase an online audio version of the book. One option is this one. If you or your parents have an Amazon account, you'll be able to get an audio book from Audible. It will definitely be worth your while. To assist you, I have made use of the talent of Marlene Zwichers, a motivational speaker and special education expert who is based in Kimberley, South Africa. She will be using her theatre training to bring the character of Patricia Wiley to life for you. As you can see, Dr. Zwichers got into character, even dressing as she thinks Patricia might have dressed. While you should enjoy these audio recordings, it doesn't absolve you of the responsibility of reading the novel yourself, especially the sections that represent the points of view of other characters. All page references are to the 2016 Picador Africa edition of the novel. In 2018, Craig Higginson addressed English teachers at the National IEB User Group Conference in Johannesburg. In an informative lecture, Higginson explained how the novel had started its life as a play. It was included in an anthology entitled At This Stage, Plays from a Post-Apartheid South Africa. The themes common to these plays are reconciliation, matriarchy, justice, accountability, corruption, truth, memory, and violence. Each one of these concepts is important to your understanding of the novel. If necessary, pause the video and write your own definitions for each of these themes. I suggest that you use A5 index cards, one for each theme. You will be able to revisit them as you progress through the novel. The play from which the novel was birthed is entitled Dream of the Dog. The plot will become familiar to you. An aged English-speaking couple, Richard and Patricia Wiley, are selling up and leaving their farm, situated in the KwaZulu-Natal Midlands. A visitor arrives unleashing a torrent of memories from the past. The difficult conversations challenge us, the theatre-goer and the reader, to confront the realities of post-apartheid South Africa. British director Jeremy Heron wrote that Higginson's plays take us to a place where the contradictions and messiness of contemporary life hold themselves up for inspection. Hmm, that could become the basis of an essay question, don't you think? While reading the novel, take note of these points. Again, if you are unsure of any of the terminology that you see, pause the video in order to do some research and add to your own notes. We'll return to this slide in a later lesson, when the concepts will start making more sense to you. For now, we're going to focus on the structure of the novel. As a play, it was presented in five acts. On stage, dialogue is of paramount importance, so you need to pay close attention to both what the characters say and how they say it. Higginson deliberately does not provide a glossary or translation of the Zulu dialogue. 
think of possible reasons for this. Drama students should recognize this, and all of you will be able to apply it to your Shakespeare play. Freitag's Pyramid is a visual representation of the structure of a five-act play. The Protasis is where characters are introduced and the subject proposed. The Epitasis is the development of the main action, while the Catastrophe is the point at which the circumstances overcome the central motive, introducing the conclusion or denouement. In simpler terms, it is a story mountain. The exposition is usually Act 1, in which the setting, characters and conflict are introduced. Act 2 consists of the rising action, as a character grapples with a problem. This leads to Act 3, the traditional climax or point of greatest suspense. In Act 4, we observe the fallout from the climax. And this leads to the final act where the conflict or problems are resolved. Take a moment to page through your novel. Part 1 or Act 1 starts on page 3, 2 on page 43, 3 on page 99, 4 on page 153 and 5 on page 211. I have used five sticky notes to mark each act. I advise you to do the same. At the very beginning of the novel, you will find the epigraph, a quote from a Ted Hughes poem. There is no better way to know us than as two wolves come separately to a wood. The poem is a modest proposal and the epigraph is the first two lines of the poem. There is conjecture that Hughes wrote this about his marriage to Sylvia Plath, a troubled marriage which ended with her suicide. With that knowledge, the highlighted lines take on a greater significance. Neither can make die the painful burning of the coal in its heart till the other's body and the whole wood is its own. In a critical essay, Anne Skeer wrote, the desire which these wolves have for each other creates a terrifying atmosphere of danger it is an all-consuming distraction in which each competes against the other for a mad final satisfaction, which will be achieved by making the other's body and the whole wood its own. You will know that wolves are magnificent if frightening creatures. They have a beauty of form, an economical directness of function, an instinctive veracity of appetite, a predatory cunning which have ensured their survival. What has this quote got to do with the novel? As you read, continually ask yourself who or what the wolves are. The foreword or preface to the novel, written by Craig Higginson, begins with these sentences. There are many houses we pass through during our lives. Maybe it's true that they also pass through us. Some of them remain with us and we are able to return to them long after they are gone. One such house was a farmhouse in KwaZulu-Natal, just over the hill of the boarding school I attended between the ages of 10 and 14. Spend some moments responding to these questions. Think about dreams, even nightmares, and think about houses. And remember that houses are not always the same 
as Holmes. The preface to the novel introduces us to these points. Obviously, houses are a key image. We are made to consider the differences between rural and urban settings, particularly in the South African context. Higginson refers to Richard and Patricia Wiley as people of their time, increasingly uneasy in a world that was rapidly outstripping them. I'm sure you'll recognize some of your own older family members in that quote. The grandparents, maybe, who are uncomfortable with so many things in our fast paced modern lives, from new technology to rapidly changing cultural mores. If you're ready, let's get stuck into Act One. We'll meet these characters. Patricia, her husband Richard, Beauty, their longtime domestic servant who is charged with looking after the increasingly incapable and senile Richard, Becky, and Mr. Ford, the retired principal of the nearby school. There are references to Patricia's late father from whom she inherited the farm. It would be wise to start a page or index card of notes for each of these main characters. You will notice that the novel is not divided into numbered chapters. Instead, we have sections of narrative giving us the point of view of a particular character. Pause the video to go over this point of view flowchart. The terminology should not be new to you, but it will be worthwhile to refresh your memory. The setting of the novel is an unprofitable dairy farm in the KwaZulu-Natal Midlands. The farm's name is Dwaleni. There are numerous references to dogs. The remaining farm dog is a Rottweiler called Etunzini. You can see a picture of a Rottweiler on the left. You will also remember that the original script was The Dream of the Dog. In the first section of part one, we read Patricia's point of view as she comes to terms with leaving Dwaleni in order to return to the Durban house in which she spent her childhood. Look out for key images, such as the cracked mirror, the wheelchair, the television set, the old car, and of course, the various types of houses that are mentioned. The next slide, will be a recording of the first chapter, for want of a better term, of the novel. Patricia, page one. She draws back the curtains to reveal the mist. It has filled the whole valley and invaded every cupboard of the house. Her bedroom overlooks a row of kennels, silvery grey and subsiding at odd angles under a great green wave of brambles. The bloodwoods, solemn as totems, are barely visible above the old dog run. She doesn't know what possessed them to plant those trees. To protect them from the wind, the sun, the view. Well, it hardly matters now. Soon the trees will be cut down and cleared away along with everything else. The people who come to live here afterwards will know nothing about any of them. And maybe it will be better that way. All that Patricia has told him is that they are going away for a while. It doesn't make sense. They have sold off all the livestock and equipment and packed the little they want to keep into boxes. Already the developers have moved in, reducing the stables and farm buildings to rubble. 
making fresh orange gashes across the fields to where the new houses will be. Producing the driveway, which went on for a kilometer through their valley to a muddy bog. But Richard rarely leaves the house these days and nothing makes much sense to him anyway. To his queries about the recent packing up, all she has told him is that they are going away to the sea. Beauty! She can hear Beauty's footsteps progressing along the corridor, swift but provisional, expecting fresh instructions. Beauty will be on her way to dress Richard. The oats will have been cooked, the coffee brewed, and the kitchen windows will be busy with the previous day's flies. Patricia knows every moment and mood of the house as intimately as she knows her own body. Better, in fact, as everything in the house can be reached for and grasped. Her body is an aging and not quite trustworthy companion whose inner workings have only grown more mysterious over time. Beauty! Beauty will have heard her for the first time, but she only ever responded on the second or the third call, perhaps hoping Patricia would forget what she wanted, or forget that she wanted anything at all. Mrs. Have you made the oats? Yeah, bon, Mrs. Beauty is wearing her blue overalls and a white duke, even though it's their last day. Her feet are bare, as usual. The rhythmic whisper of her feet up and down the corridor, like a conversation between Two conspirators once irritated Patricia, but these days she finds the sound comforting. In Durban, Beauty will go for driving and English lessons. She deserves a better job, possibly as an au pair. Patricia and Richard will not be there forever, and the girl will need to move on. She has a whole life ahead of her. Um, I think we should have breakfast together today. Could you bring Richard through? Yeah, bo, Mrs. Patricia can see herself in the large mirror near the door. It was once attached to the wall and is speckled around the edges. There's a crack across the reflection of her throat. Her body is no longer able to fit into the mirror. It stands there like a pale floating lantern. Uh, this morning I have to go and see Miss, Mr. Ford. Yeah, bon, Mrs. I will tell Becky. Thanks. Beauty crosses the room to fetch Patricia's walker. A battered metal frame that relieves some of the pressure of her back. The wheelchair, which lives in the sitting room, is something she tries to avoid. Not only does it embarrass her, more recently it has started to dig into her back. Ah, I couldn't sleep last night. Could you? Mm, uh, not so good, Mrs. No, 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 not so good at all. 
outside. The old Rottweiler has started barking. Patricia always knows at once what the sound means. Ituzini has seen one of the stable cats. A woman from the dairy is bringing in the morning milk. A stranger has arrived at the house, their car having survived the driveway. These days there is more traffic up and down their road, but it's usually earth movers and trucks. Etunzini, who hasn't quite worked out how to handle them, contents herself with barking from the apparent safety of the lawn. This eruption means the morning milk, so they both ignore it. Breakfast is laid out as usual in the small room at the back of the house, which adjoins the kitchen. The window panes are indeed being patrolled by flies through the mist. Patricia can see the fir tree outside, where the bodies of freshly slaughtered lambs were hung. The two rows of bloodwoods that led towards the dairy and the larger sheds march off in ever-diminishing tones of grey. Rupert and George would normally have been there to greet her before returning to snapping up the flies. But she had them shot a week ago and buried under the fir tree at the front. Only Itunzini remains. Although of the same dotage as the two Alsatians, Patricia hadn't yet had the stomach to have the Rottweiler killed. But her grave has been waiting for her all week, flanked by those of the Alsatians, as though the other two dogs, who were always more adventurous, have gone to secure the underworld ahead of her. All her life. Patricia has been accompanied by a hurricane of dogs. Usually chihuahuas and a rottweiler and a few variations between. The last chihuahua, Finnegan, died in her lap 18 months ago. Her heart just stopped. <sighs> when her body had gone cold, Patricia asked Becky to bury her in the bloodwood grove, where all the other dogs had been buried. It was on that day that she decided to sell the farm. It was the right decision, of course. Even back then, Richard needed a proper trained nurse. And it was ridiculous the way he sometimes wondered about. Shortly after the death of Finnegan, he disappeared for a whole night. Peggy later found him naked, inside a disused porcupine hole that he'd scooped out. There were bits of grass and burrs in his beard. Patricia and Beauty had a private laugh about it, but it couldn't carry on. None of it could. She worked out that if she sold the farm, there would still be enough to live off. The Durban house was 150 years old, and whenever anyone walked inside it, it creaked like an ancient ship. It stood on top of the hill in Glenwood and overlooked the harbour and the bluff. Oh, it was the house she had grown up in and she has had dreams about it, her whole adult life. 
She wanted to spend her last days doing little more than staring at the sea. She pours a glass of orange juice from the Toby jug and grunting with the pain of it sits. There are still weaver birds nesting in the fir tree. They sway and twitter and clack. The room smells of Alsatian and oats and leaking gas. She has decided not to get the cooker fixed. She has been rather hoping the whole house would go up in smoke, with all of them inside it. Huh? Even now, Richard has the ability to appear by magic. He must have evaded beauty as he's still wearing his pyjamas, pale blue cotton stained with tea and smears of bran rusk. The pyjamas are the same steady tone as his gaze, which is fixed on Patricia as if she's in an oncoming storm. Morning, Richard. Are you going to sit? Uh, Would you like a cup of tea? Beauty! I want to take the dogs. What? Uh, to my father's place. I, I want to take them to, uh, there tonight. Right. It is not the fact of the dogs being shot that amuses her. It is that his father died Twenty years ago. What's, what's there to laugh about? He wants to know. Well, your father is um, no longer with us. What are you talking about? Too many pies. Richard turns away from this and sits. He stares at his hands. But I, I saw him only yesterday. We shared a cigarette. Beauty appears and goes over to the stove to revive the oats. Richard doesn't seem to notice her. Although he was never much of a farmer, he has the hands of one. How long has it been since Patricia last touched them? or being touched by them. She probably comes into contact with them every day, but contact is very far from touch. Where's the television gone? Hacked. Uh, someone must have taken it. We're leaving tomorrow. Everything has to be packed. Richard turns towards her, perhaps about to scream at her, or throw his mug against the wall, but still he seems unable to meet her gaze. Are we uh, dead yet? No. You will tell me when we're dead. If I can, Rue, I will. She can feel Beauty's bemusement as she approaches and scoops some oats into each of their bowls. Patricia takes a bowl and adds brown sugar from a fluted sugar bowl that once belonged to a grandmother and cream, leaving Richard to fend for himself. Oh, sugar will be the death of her. But you have to die of something, and it's better to die of something that you like, like pies. I was, uh, I was dreaming. Yes? That we were dead. Patricia starts to eat her oats. Well, we were uh, in heaven or hell, I can't say which. I, I doubt it mattered. All that mattered was that we were dead, and we didn't bloody well know it. 
No one had told us. Oh, who would have? Oh, God, probably. Well, he won't have because we're not. Uh, we're not. Well, not quite. She has many strategies to silence him. One of them, and often the most effective, is wit. Richard gives himself sugar and cream, like one who deserves a treat. He has always eaten exactly the same as her, yet he has remained wiry and tough throughout like a jockey. There's no justice in this, nor in anything else. Because he's coming. What is coming? The ambulance. I said I have two dead children for you to pick up. What do you mean, two? You know what? No, I don't. You think I'm not here, but I am. Rue, I know very well you're here. Patricia has owned the same car for 25 years. A cream-colored Mercedes. Rupert and George ripped the beige plastic paneling off the doors several years ago, leaving the metal of the door frames exposed. But she has long ceased to notice this. There are more recent tartan rugs and horse blankets covering the back seats, each of which has been shredded. The damage usually takes place when Patricia and Becky go into the spa and leave the dogs. Paradoxically, to um, protect the car. They try to attack whoever passes and then turn on the car as the only alternative. They have been a familiar sight in the village. <laughs> the large, muddy Mercedes, the agitated dogs, Shy Zulu man in the impeccable dark blue overalls and the woman emerging, pale and strangely buoyant, a metal walker measuring their progress towards the shop. But in recent years, they have started to appear out of place. What was once a working farmer's village the air full of muck from the former cattle market and the honking of trains carrying timber has become more upmarket. Surrounding farms are being turned into golfing estates and syndicated trout farms, small shops selling handmade pottery. Woven rugs and leather goods have sprung up. This air of uh, gentility is only disrupted at weekends at the liquor store when farm workers gather to play marabaraba and get drunk on quarts of beer. Becky is waiting for her at the front stoop after breakfast. He folds the walker and puts it into the boot. Becky will be driving them down to Durban the next day and has agreed to stay on as their gardener and chauffeur. Patricia tried to send him to a better school when he was still a boy, but it soon became clear that Becky had no interest in books. What he seemed to love more than anything else was the car which he would clean for a few rand whenever he had the opportunity. Patricia would let him sit inside the car for whole afternoons until one day she showed him how to start it up, put it into gear and edge forward. By the time it was becoming too painful for Patricia to drive herself, Becky had long since attained his license. We have to go across to Mr. Ford. Yebo, madam. And while I'm there, perhaps you could take the car to the garage and fill up. Remember to check the tyres. 
We have a long journey ahead of us tomorrow. Yebo, yeah, madam. Becky has driven to Durban before. Unlike beauty, he has seen the sea. But he has never spent more than a few nights outside the boundaries of the farm. Let alone lived in a large city. Whenever she has asked him about the move, he has remained evasive. So she has no idea whether it is quiet excitement or dread, he feels, or a combination of the two. Peggy rarely speaks to her outside of what is practical. The driveway of Dualeni passes the long line of rubble that was once the stables before entering what remains of the paddocks. The road then declines gradually towards the marshlands, passes one of the larger dams and ends in a gum and wattle plantation where it finally joins the tarmac road. Previously, mountain streams crossed the road in several places, and whenever there was a thunderstorm, sections of the meandering orange driveway could be washed into the bush. Oh, but now the road is worse than before. Huge corrugated tire tracks crisscross it, leading off into the fields to one of the new half-constructed houses. All around are trenches, filled with yellow sludge, plastered trees and torn fences. This verdant stretch, which was once a favourite place of Patricia's, breathing place between the real world and the farm, has been reduced to a war zone, in which men wander about in the mist like wounded soldiers, their boots heavy with mud. The car labours past upsided orange trucks, a row of tin shacks that some workers have crudely assembled, and a fire in an old oil barrel. By now, the rain has thickened to a steady mizzle and everything is blurred with it. They are just passing out of this nightmare zone and are nearing the marsh when the car slithers off to one side and smacks against the wall of clay and rock. Christ, be careful! The engine has cut out. And for a while, they watch the fine rain against the windscreen. The wipers vainly swiping it aside. An exercise in futility. You'll have to reverse slowly, otherwise we'll get stuck. Without a word, Becky backs the car and regains the track. It is almost impossible to see out of the steamed up windows and when a rock clumps dubiously against the bottom of the car, neither of them comments. After that, Becky drives with exaggerated deliberation and care. If blame is to be attributed, he seems to be implying, it lies with the chaos of the road or the folly of the boulders or the folly of having boulders in the first place. At the marsh, they find a long-tailed widow bird laboring under his heavy, wet tail. Red bishops swing in the reeds, their feathers ruffled and fluffed out. Solitary stray donkey stares at them as they pass, his body streaked with wet making him resemble a quacha. Between Patricia and Becky, 
the silence feels deeper than usual. Maybe Mbeki will be delighted to see the back of this place tomorrow after all. Which in clearer moments is her attitude to the farm, which she inherited from her father when she and Richard made their mismatch, has never managed to make much profit. It's too rocky and, at least in the summer months, too wet. It started to do slightly better only in the 70s, when Patricia decided to breed Welsh ponies and started to take over the management of the farm from Richard. As for Richard, he gave up any pretense at being any good at anything after her father died. Before Richard's illness, he contented himself with little more than a barn full of chickens, a modest dairy herd, and some general meandering about. Do you think uh, the old man would be unhappy we were leaving? Becky stares ahead, saying nothing to this. It isn't rudeness. Or if it is, it has been so characteristic over the last years that it no longer seems to matter. Becky tends to let conversation pass him by like a pleasant breeze occupying an altogether different landscape. And she has developed the habit of using this vacant space to talk freely, as one might with a priest or, heaven forbid, some kind of analyst. Do you remember my father, Becky? Yeah, well, madam. I was already cleaning your car when he passed. Well, I've been thinking a lot about him lately. He might have died too young. But even then, he had a full life to look back on and a great deal to be proud of. He was fortunate in that way. Most of us, most of us don't have that, do we? Becky inclines his head, but declines to comment. He has also earned it, mind you, through hard work and what my mother used to call character. He never complained. He used to say, if you don't like it, change it. Don't sit with a problem, feeling sorry for yourself. He was always up at five every morning, and he only sat down again at five that evening, usually with a glass of whiskey in his hand. And that was when he made himself available to his family and his friends. Oh, and the dinners we had! At that house, you'll see it, Becky. The house has a lovely view of the harbour. My favourite view in all the world. I do not like to look at the sea, Becky says. Barely audible. My father only spoke against Richard once when I said... I wanted to marry him, but he gave his consent when he found out I was pregnant and he never spoke against Richard again after that. Even after he'd seen the disaster he was already making of everything. They say he was a good man. Mm. The one good man in my life. Before the next lesson, ensure that you have annotated your novel and started writing your own notes. If you wish to purchase study guides, then I highly recommend these two. Both of them are available as digital online resources. 
That ends your first lesson on the Dream House. I look forward to your joining me for lesson two.